Hello, everyone. My name is Alan Dick. And on behalf of my fellow Commerce Next co-founders, Scott Silverman and Veronica Sansev, I want to welcome you to today's webinar. Today is Wednesday, March 17th, March 10th, excuse me, 2021. And our topic this week is marketing attribution in support of a full funnel strategy. Before we go any further, I'd like to welcome and thank today's speakers. First of all, we have Kelly Sternhagen. She's with Cost Plus World. She's their VP of e-commerce marketing analytics and strategy. Jeff Sanders, he's a CMO of First Leaf. Kuman Akvan, CMO at carparts.com, and Martin Simo, the current CDB principal at Bloomreach. I wanted to do some additional thanks here. I want to thank our sponsor today, Bloomreach. Thank you very much for sponsoring. We appreciate it. We also have a gifting sponsor, GiftNow from Loop Commerce. Uh, they're going to give five lucky live attendees uh, a chance to receive a gift of their choice. Sorry, replay listeners, can't help you with that one. And the audience, thank you so much for joining us today. We certainly love having you with us. Today's agenda, we're going to take a sneak preview of next week's webinar. We're then going to go through the housekeeping notes to help you get the most out of this webinar. Bloom Reach has a brief presentation. We're going to take your temperature, take a look at the audience polls, get, uh, get your opinion on things. And then the majority of the time will be spent with a panel discussion and audience Q&A. First up, next week. The, uh, our webinar next week on the 17th is going to be Advanced Content Marketing Strategies from Publishers to Influencers. That's going to be at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. We'll have Sir Latop, Reward Style, Our Place, and Partner Eyes joining us. That should be a great, uh, great webinar for you. Just also want to let you know that we have a YouTube channel with over 100 plus videos on it. That's a great place for you to dig into our old content, see what we've got in there. And now, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Martin Simo. Martin, thanks so much for joining us today. Hey, Alan. So hi, everyone. I'm Martin. Uh, I'll introduce myself briefly, and I'll also introduce our company. So I'll start with myself. Uh, I started my career in marketing as a data analyst. I then moved on to co-founding a marketing consultancy agency with a couple of jobs in between that. Uh, that eventually resulted in me being a chief marketing officer for a multinational e-commerce brand. And now, since December, I've uh, joined Exponia, which has recently been acquired by Bloomreach and lead the CDP uh, part of our product marketing. So uh, I'll say a couple of words about Exponia. Uh, we are a CDP. And <clears throat> yeah, let's, let's go into the rest of the presentation. So what are we going to talk about today? Uh, the topic is full funnel attribution. So first of all, uh, in these uh slides i will talk a bit about uh, about how we see mature attribution in uh, exponia and uh how to sort of get there this is based on our experience with our customers but also from the experience of our team uh, and the companies they've worked at previously uh now uh, then we like another interesting topic that's super relevant right now is how does attribution work without cookies that's something that's really picking up traction now uh, and then the third topic, if we get to that, might be interesting to talk about is the attribution, does attribution clash with customer privacy? So what's going on there? Now, without further ado, I'll introduce the sort of attribution maturity levels. So this is sort of the way uh, we look at like how mature our companies in terms of attribution. As I said, this is based on our experience with our clients and it's also based on the experience of our big and super smart team. Uh, so I will touch briefly on sort of how we look at this. So level one, this would be an attribution model where you evaluate channels individually and independently. So you have your person who's running your Facebook ads, they look at their Facebook data. The person who's running Google ads looks at Google data and they sort of don't have any ways of uh, comparing those two channels. Then if you move on to level two, uh, this is where you start to uh, this is where you start to pull all of the channel data into a, into a single analytics tool. You are doing that because you obviously want to be able to compare how different channels are performing and what's the relative performance there. Uh, this has like this moves you to another level, but it's not without its challenges. So we've seen companies from this level go to level three, which is they start looking into channel based attribution modeling. At this point, what you are looking at is you're trying to figure out uh, which channels affect what percentage of revenue. 
So you are uh, at this point at level three is when you start thinking about you no, know, not just last click non-direct attribution as is the default in Google Analytics, but you look at also other attribution models. So U-shaped, uh, first touch, uh, linear, data-driven, anything that happens comes on level three. Uh, then there's level four. At level four, you realize that the attribution models uh, have their limitations and that you need to sort of figure out how to work around those limitations. So what you start doing is you start measuring causal impact of budget changes at channel level. Uh, what I mean by that is, let's say you run a big uh, TV, TV campaign, you've spent millions of dollars in TV ad spend, you want to see uh, the impact that had on the revenue which you generated. Uh, so there are statistical methods here. Causal impact is one of them. Holdout groups is also a method you would be using at this level. Then uh, level four also still has its limitations. So you want to push further. Uh, at level five, we have companies who allocate budgets with respect to buyer stage and measure causal impact of changes, not just on revenue, but also on the sort of full funnel. And this is where uh, we will spend a lot of discussion today, I'm assuming, uh, because this is where it gets really fun. Uh, when you start to not only look at conversions and you're not only attributing, uh, you're not only looking at attribution of revenue, but you're also thinking about, uh, you're thinking more about top of the funnel and trying to figure out how you can uh, measure that. And then, and this is, it's called level five plus because there's uh, uh, we believe there's a couple of levels between five and this one, but level five plus would be self-optimizing AI powered by journeys at scale. So what we mean by this buzzword filled level name is uh, you would look at your customers as they interact with your brand at any touch point and based on a minimum number number of interactions you will uh, sort of try to identify which stage of the buying process they're in. And then based on you being able to identify that stage, you would uh, sort of bucket them into a scenario that would automatically pick uh, the appropriate form of communications across all channels. So th this is sort of like how we envision the future to be. Maybe it will be even more exciting than this, but uh, this is something where we see the world moving. Uh, one example I could give of a company that's maybe close to this would be perhaps Netflix. Uh, if you come to their website, all they will bombard you with their free trial and every ad you will see will always be sort of trying to get you to get the free trial. And only once you get to the free trial, you'll start to see uh, ads that uh, are aimed to drive retention. So that would be like an example of level five plus from the customer standpoint. Now, some more, uh, some more intro for the topic number two, and that would be attribution without cookies. So uh, as I'm sure many of you are aware, uh, third party cookie tracking is dying slowly. Safari has already killed it. Firefox has already killed it. Chrome has said that they will kill it come 1st January of 2022. And uh, a couple of days ago, they released a press release saying that they will enable customers to try their new privacy sandbox starting in April. So that means it might be coming even sooner than we thought. And so how does attribution work without cookies? Uh, cookies is, are a technology that's used to basically identify a, the same customer across many different, uh, many different sessions and just by saying that, it should be obvious that uh, it's a very important technology for attribution modeling. Because if you are not able to identify the person as they come to your website uh, multiple times, it becomes really, really hard uh, to do attribution right. Uh, some examples of what we've seen with these recent changes include a customer that has seen a 30% drop in revenue from email. Uh, they got really scared. They wrote us an email like, guys, we see a 30% drop in revenue from email. One of the things Exponia does is marketing automation and email. So that's why they were reaching out to us. And uh, the interesting thing was that we found that there was no, no loss in terms of total revenue. It was just a loss in terms of attribution. So the 30% drop in revenue they saw 
was not an actual drop in revenue. It was just that the 30%, they were no longer able to attribute to email correctly, uh, which I think is super interesting because it brings up the topic of uh, how do we trust our data if they can change dramatically without any change in customer behavior. And then the third sort of interesting thing here is uh, the conversion feedback loop to our ad campaigns is being broken with these cha cookie changes. And that's one thing where we, yeah, and I'll talk about that a bit uh, in the next slide. But first, I wanted to uh, sort of look at something that might serve as inspiration here. So we discussed this in the prep call with the other speakers on Monday. And sort of the topic that came up was first party data strategy. And first party data strategy is uh, your answer to the question, where are you going to get the data? How are you going to get the data in a world where cookies will no longer able will where cookies will no longer be able to help you uh, identify customers across sessions? And I think a really interesting inspiration comes from Tesco and their club card. Uh, the Tesco loyalty program is credited by many to be a huge success. But a lot of people don't really understand why it was successful. The success of the program was not because it was a good form of promotion, as you can see highlighted in the quote, uh, because it would be a very expensive promotion to give discounts to your most loyal customers, where you stand to lose the most by giving them discounts. The real benefit of that scheme was that they were able to get very rich data sets on those customers and then scale the insights they learned on the small group of customers that had the loyalty card and use those insights to improve the customer experience for everyone. So first party data strategy is really key and you should be really thinking about it. And that brings me to a specific example of uh, how Exponia is helping their customers. And when I say Exponia, uh, it's now Bloomreach, but we still have exponia.com that's live. So uh, if you're interested in that, you should go there. Uh, so Conversions API is a solution by Facebook that they rolled out to sort of help advertisers uh, mitigate the impact of the cookie changes. So this is how conversion tracking used to work before. A customer would come to your website, a pixel would set their cookie. Uh, and then whatever behavior that they did on the website, it fired an event and sent it to Facebook. Now, what's happening with that is that the website, since the cookie is expired or dead, the website is no longer able to send that to identify the user. So the browser is not able to send the pixel event to Facebook. Now, how Exponia comes into question there is we are able to identify the customer. So we circumvent the browser problem and we help our customers uh, and our clients uh, identify their customers. And then using a server side conversions API event, we are able to uh, supplement the pixel data and sort of fix the broken feedback loop. Uh, and that's all the pitching I'm going to do in this conversation because you guys are here to hear a discussion. But if you want to hear uh, a professional pitch by one of our, uh, one of our talented people, you can go to exponia.com and request a demo. They'll be happy to talk you through it. Uh, and then the third topic is attribution and privacy. So customers don't want brands invading their privacy. At least they say so, but then they still don't really, like, I don't know how many of you read the cookie consents, but I just click OK on them, and I think most people are the same. Uh, but then there's rules and regulations, which sort of attach a high cost to tracking without consent. So uh, attribution and privacy is also an interesting topic we might touch on in the discussion. And now to sort of summarize the presentation. So what uh, I think would be good takeaways for you even before we start conversing, but hopefully <laughs> these will only get reinforced. What you need is a solid first party data strategy that will survive the death of cookies. That's, that should be one of your key priorities. Uh, you also need to engage your customers in a way that clearly communicates the value uh, exchange when you are trying to get to their data. And the third thing you should do is always think about the full funnel. If your KPIs and all your attribution models are all purely focused on conversion-based metrics and like the end conversion, you'll lose sight of the customer. And with this slide, I will uh, give the word back to Alan, who will take it from me. All right. For uh, for going through that, I really appreciate it. Let's uh, 
Let's head over to the polls. So before we do, just a quick reminder for those of you who may have joined us late, uh, you can uh, chat with the speakers, you can ask questions of the speakers, all using the functionality in the upper right hand corner of our screen. If you're watching this as a, a recording after the event, uh, you can download any documents uh, that we have and using the I I icon at the bottom right of your screen. All right, so let's go to the polls. Question number one, what type of attribution modeling are you using? Now you can choose all that apply. You can use first click, last click, last non-direct click, and that removes the direct interactions with your site, linear attribution, time decay, U-shape position, based attribution, data-driven attribution, or other. Yes, we, we do have a lot of options there for you, but we wanted you to have a chance to, to take a look at that. So let's see how the polls are coming in. We have first click, last click, last non-direct, linear, time decay, U-shaped, data-driven, or other. Last click is definitely in the lead. 40% of you are using last click attribution. Data-driven attribution looks like our second place winner uh, at about 17 to 18%. First click is 15% and the rest are in the single digits. Interesting. So last click definitely still rules. Very good. Let's go to our second question. What attribution challenges do you and your team face? Now, again, you can choose all that apply. Is it choosing the most relevant attribution model? Understanding the overall impact of our marketing mix, accounting for interactions that you don't measure like word of mouth or TV ad views, properly attributing top of funnel branding interactions, and or finding resources to improve your attribution efforts. All right. Yeah, as we kind of suspected, uh, attributing top of funnel branding interactions uh, definitely is a concern. We'll talk about that. Uh, understanding the overall impact of our marketing mix, another one. Yeah, they're all concerns. But the only one that isn't a concern uh, are finding the resources. I mean, 11% of you are having that issue. So it looks like 28% uh, of you are, are properly doing top of funnel attribution. That's a problem. 27% uh, understanding the overall impact and coming in in third place, accounting for interactions we don't measure like word of mouth or TV ad views. Very good. Thank you so much for that one. Our final one is kind of a bonus question. Uh, we were discussing about how we could get more folks to see our webinars. And the question that uh, we'd like to ask you is, what would incentivize you to refer a friend to attend the Commerce Next webinar? And you can check all that apply again. You can have a $100 Amazon gift card, perhaps a nice gift like a Yeti coffee mug or an ember heated travel thermos. Perhaps an hour of mentoring from one of our board of advisors. We have some folks on there uh, whose an hour of their time is quite, quite useful. Swag bag full of products from direct consumer brands or none of the above. Sharing just isn't for me. So let's see where this is coming out. Guys are definitely going for the Amazon gift card. <laughs> I'm gonna give this a second. I wanna see this one play all the way through. All right. Well, half of you are definitely scoring the Amazon gift card. You like getting your own stuff. The Yeti coffee mug or heated travel thermos, that's definitely uh, resonating. You dig the swag bags. Uh, that's about 16% of you. And only 4% of you say that sharing's not for you. Well, that's nice to hear. That's nice to hear that sharing is caring. All right. Great. Let's close that one out. All right. And with that... I think I'd like to bring up our panel. Hey, guys. How are you? Good, 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 good. Thanks, thanks so much for joining us today. Really nice having you. Uh, I think we should start off with introductions. We've all met uh, Martin, but uh, Kelly, why don't we start with you? We'll introduce you and then uh, Human and then Jeff. Great. My name is Kelly Sternhagen. Right now I'm with Cost Plus World Market. But my background is in marketing analytics, um, both on the brand and the agency side. Started out doing market mix modeling for companies and then rode through the multi-touch attribution wave. And so now I'm trying to figure out where we're going next. I'm really excited to be here. So thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us. 
Come on with that gorgeous looking piano behind you. <laughs> that, that is, for the record, that is a virtual background. Um, yeah, my name is Human Akavan, Chief Marketing Officer at CarParts.com. You know, super excited to be invited back for this kind of second, uh, you know, second uh, chapter of Full Funnel Attribution. I think with a lot of the stuff that Martin shared with the news breaking out and the announcements that Google has made recently, it couldn't have been a, a better time to kind of have these conversations. So I'm really looking forward to the conversation um, and the ideas that are going to be shared today. All right, great. And Jeff, let's bring you in. Hi, folks. I'm Jeff Sanders. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at Firstleaf. Uh, I run performance marketing, brand marketing, creative, and digital product. Uh, this is a really fascinating topic to me because it's one that I've been faced, facing for years, and it's interesting to see how it comes up and what's similar and what's different from you know smaller DTC brands to even Fortune 50 companies like Citibank, where I sort of grew up as a marketer. But uh, everyone's struggling with this one, so it's uh, great to be part of the panel on this. Yeah, thanks again, everyone, for joining us. So I guess I think we should begin this with what does full funnel attribution mean to all of you? We heard what Martin's thoughts on it. Kelly, why don't we kick this off with you? Full funnel attribution, I think, is all about assigning value to those things that are hard to measure. Those things that tend to be at the bottom of the funnel that are click-based are easier to tackle. But what about things like store visits? And the value of a YouTube view, value of a sign up for the loyalty program, or you know, what does it mean when somebody follows your uh, organic Instagram channel? What is that worth to your brand? So I think we've focused a lot on the bottom of the funnel, which is great, but without a top of funnel view, it's an incomplete picture. Yep, I agree. I agree. Women? Yeah, I think in the most simplistic way, in a full funnel strategy for me is really understanding the customer journey and making sure that you're present in the channels where your customer is most likely to interact with your brand. Um, in many cases, I see marketers that get so, so engulfed in the bottom of the funnel marketing because it's easy to measure, and they end up losing, uh, leaving opportunity on the table, You know, such as television, word of mouth marketing. These are channels that are much more difficult to measure. Um, so for me, it's really understanding where the customer is present and, and having your presence and your message there but also you know, having the right measurement in place so you can you know, understand how these other channels are performing. Um, so yeah, that's it for me. Okay, Jeff, I'll let you chime in on this. Sure, and, and so to me, this, this means understanding how your marketing inputs change consumer behavior. And so I think an important part of this definition to me is that it's really understanding what you're doing to change what people do, not just measure what happens before they do it. Right. And there's it's sort of this difference between incrementality and attribution. And I'll I'll touch on that a little bit later. But it's it's great if you can measure everything that happened before someone converted. But I don't think it qualifies if it didn't actually change what the consumer was going to do. Yeah, I definitely want to uh, come back to incrementality versus attribution. And I definitely want to talk about top of funnel. But I think I kind of like to follow up with the retailers again. And um, I kind of want to create that baseline for everybody, you know, we know what full funnel means to you, but what does that look like in a mature attribution program at scale? What what does that look like? Jeff, I'll, I'll kick that one to you. Sure. So a, a few parts here, and these are you know fairly tactical, but I also think they're important to get right, you know, sort of garbage in, garbage out, right? But so the, I think some of the foundational elements are, first of all, having a clear sense of what you're solving for, right? Is it a is it a cost per action? Is it a return on ad spend? Is it some lifetime value, right? The way that you put that and the way that into your attribution system uh, matters a lot, right? The second is having a clean source of data feeding in into whatever system is doing the math. Um, the third is, you know, a tool that, uh, that processes the data according to an approach that all of the key stakeholders agree upon, right? I think it, it's not good enough to just have a black box tool. And so folks need to understand and buy into whatever methodology is being used. And, and then finally, and, and I think really importantly, some tool that's actually there for decision support, right? Because this this is, yeah, it's great to know what's going on, but it's more important to say, well, what should we do then, right? Like, where should we increase spend? Where should we pull back, right? How do we get more for everything we're doing? And so a critical part is the tool that actually allows you and your team to do that. Yep. Yep, you you hit on a number of points we're going to be we're going to be hitting on here. Kelly, any additional thoughts on that one? I just 
echo everything that Jeff said there and add one point, which is be data agnostic to a certain extent. Don't say no to any important data that's coming in, a well-designed lift test or a well-designed foot traffic study. It, I always say yes to that because more data is better and you can always augment your single source of truth or your system of record with an additional point of view with a different sample set or a different sample size. And I think it just helps round out the picture. So always say yes, more is better than less data. Um, and then just be careful about how you use it. Yeah, and Human, I'll give you, I see you're nodding your head there. I think you might wanna yeah. get in on this. Yeah, plus one for me as well. Um, I, I would just say, you know, in a very simplistic way is have a clear understanding of what your different marketing touch points and the role they play in that ultimate goal that you're measuring for. If it's a revenue, a conversion, a cost per action, as Jeff mentioned, um, but also make sure to ingest multiple sources of data. Sometimes you'll see people there overly get consumed with one source of information, but sometimes, you know, maybe for upper funnel or TV ads or that word of mouth campaign, having post-purchase surveys or having different insights. And sometimes there's different tools that are designed to measure different channels, right? Television analytics or attribution may be different than bottom of the funnel. So making sure you have multiple sources of information to just really inform your strategy overall. Yeah, we yeah. are getting a lot of questions. Martin, did Maybe, you have something to say? Yeah, I, I just wanted to sort of uh, reiterate because I think both Jeff and Kelly touched on this. I, I think it's really important to think of the data as something that helps you understand customer behavior. So the, the, you're gathering the data because you want to understand the customer. It's, uh, it's really not going to give you the results you want if you're gathering the data just to report to your CFO or to your CEO or to justify the size of the budget that you're having. Like it, it's really important to keep in mind that this is about the customer and understanding them. Absolutely. I was going to say to Huma, we're getting reading a lot of uh, audience questions in. I want to start getting to some of them. Um, I too, Julie Lyle, I was very disappointed uh, that Human was not going to be playing piano today. Uh, we were looking for uh, a, a musical break in about 10 minutes. So many apologies to you. We're sorry we teased you with that. Um, but we did talk about, I'm going to bounce around just a little bit here. I think it's interesting you guys are talking about data because one thing that kept coming up in the in the call that we had prior to this, even in the discussion just before, was about having a really healthy skepticism towards your data. And I almost feel like just throwing that piece of you know, that question out to you and letting you scramble uh, to sit and try to fight over that one. So that, that's a that's a that's a free one there. Who wants to who wants to start with that one? I'll, I'll go for it. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, don't trust third party reporting at face value. And, um, and I have a great example of attribution gone wrong. And that might actually be an entire commerce next series in itself. Um, earlier this year, there was um, reports of Uber with that $100 million in advertising spend that they identified to be wasted. And I think what happened was for them, it was a, a campaign to drive installs of the Uber app. Um, and what they found is the third party was claiming credit for a bunch of app downloads. And, you know, somehow with an Uber, they, they felt like, hey, this is driving that acquisition, that target that they're trying to drive. And they kept spending in that channel. What they realized, found out that there was actually ad fraud going on where this third party ad network was claiming credit for organic installs that were going to happen anyways. So I think sometimes and what they ended up doing as a test is they actually shut off you know, the ad spend and they realize no impact to their overall business metrics. Um, so I think that's a very key point of like attribution gone wrong. It's like you're overly focused in one set of reporting, but you don't really understand the consumer behavior as Martin alluded to, that's really going on in the back end, right? It's just another third party report. Clearly there was ad fraud involved in here as well too, but that is a job as a marketer. If you're responsible for $1 spend, it's really your responsibility at the end of the data Make sure you're pulling in enough information from different reporting sources so you can understand, hey, is that is that advertising really incremental? So that's you know, that's that's one pitfall that I would definitely watch out for is don't just trust any third party report. Make sure you have enough a full view of your attribution models to really understand what's taking place. And I'll just jump in. I, I saw that Gwen had a question around yep. convincing CFOs that each step in the in the journey has incremental value. And I'm gonna come down with a controversial statement, which is sort of my style and say, I agree with your CFO. Um, your job as a marketer is to drive the best outcomes for the business at a 
uh, the lowest rate possible. And so test it, you know, bring them along and test it. Uh, we've gotten a lot of things done in my current role this way. And it's sort of our approach is somebody has a hypothesis and you want to prove it out. Like, okay, let's control that. And don't be afraid to turn things off. Like your worth as a marketer is not tied to the size of your budget. That's sort of a 1960s approach that we've moved past. So I think that the culture of marketing is changing and really embracing this data-driven approach. Um, and so I think that, you know, you and your CFO have the same goal, right? To drive the marketing outcomes with the, the lowest budget possible. And so to just design a test, bring them along and um, incrementally turn things off one by one, turn them back on and see what impact they're having in the broader scale of the marketing mix. Um, matched market testing is really great for this. So yeah, I, I, I love that question. That's great. In that context, it's really important to not just take what comes out of the system at face value, because if you're doing that, it's probably even harder to convince the CFO. I mean, one example from um, a past organization that I worked at that was a large, uh, a large company, uh, another team was using a multi-touch attribution model and saw that their retargeting efforts had what appeared to be a 1,700% ROAS. So for every dollar they spent, they would get $17 of revenue and sort of they took it at face value and 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 uh, I think obviously got the CFO excited about that and poured a lot of money into that and it actually didn't generate a seven, 17 to 1 return on investment and so uh, at least they did the right thing by by bringing the CFO along from the process of testing it but that's also a case of understanding you know does that pair of shoes following you around the internet really drive that many sales or could it be something else uh, and, and then designing the uh, you know, having the skepticism and designing the experiments to really suss that out. Yeah, it does seem like there has to be a very healthy set of like what I would call confident skepticism, but you also have to be confident in you and your team's ability to suss things out and try new things. It's like you're constantly on this, this balance between um, art and science, for lack of a better word. Would you guys agree with that? Is that is you know, and if that's the case, is that how you try to form teams? Are you you know, do you want the one guy who's just super into data and the other one who kind of thinks more holistically? Is that is that useful in an environment like this where data seems to be king? Yeah, I'll take I'll take that one just to kick us off. I think what I tell my teams is that marketing analytics doesn't exist in black and white, like a lot of other professions have the benefit of doing. Um, we live in the gray. And so I, I do design my teams in that way. People who have um, an, a sort of a more social psychology approach to understanding data, which is that every data has bias, no data set is perfect. And that to balance out that bias and imperfection, you have to take several different data sources and combine them. And that's where the insight generation comes in. So I, I like to recruit for people who are critical thinkers above and beyond any, anything else. You can teach how to use a tool set. You can teach how to write SQL or Python, but like you can't teach the way of thinking about research questions and a hypothesis validation um, that I think that you really need to do a good job in this type of role. And then the second thing I would add is that, you know, I know everybody's good at marketing and anybody could do marketing, right? but we actually have really valuable instincts. And so trust your instincts to generate the hypotheses. And I think if something doesn't pass the sniff test, again, with that healthy skepticism, don't trust it and check another data source. Excellent. Jeff, Martin, who want any other comments on that? Yeah, to follow on to that, I, I don't think that a modern marketing organization can be successful if there's a brand team and a performance team and no connection between them, or if there's a marketing team and an analytics team. And so the way I tend to think about it is trying to find in general, you know, T-shaped marketers. And so folks who deeply know their area, but can bridge those gaps, because if everyone's just throwing stuff over the wall to somewhere else, you're just not going to get great results, right? You need people who can interpret other disciplines into theirs to really get the full value of a marketing org. Yeah. And I, I think, Sorry, come on, go ahead. Oh, no, go for it. Okay, so uh, when Kelly said it, she likes to sort of keep this balance, or Alan, maybe you alluded to it, the balance between art and uh, data-driven people, like brand and performance, I also 
think about it from a different standpoint. Like I also think it's helpful to have skeptics on your team who are always looking uh, and doubting the data and, but not just the data, but also sort of the creative hypotheses. Like a skeptic, I think, is a mindset, and that will be close to critical thinking that Kelly mentioned. But then you also need to have uh, to balance that some decision makers, like some people who will be able to say, like now we have enough data, it's time to go. There, there's like there's no point in trying to figure out anything else with data. We need to cut that channel off and see the impact that's going to have. Yeah, yeah just I like to, to think I of attribution as a, a journey not a destination because it's all about it's going to change it's going to be changing forever and that's why it's exciting yeah i was just going to add to that is you, you want to have a healthy balance right you don't want to get lost in the data where you stop making positive business decisions at the end of the day and in terms of you know how do you you know work with your cfo to help them understand what positive business outcomes are being driven is Sometimes trying to translate the metrics. I mean, sometimes in marketing, it's changing so dramatically. There's different reports, different tools, and things like that. Maybe look at your total revenue, profitability. Maybe look at net profit. Look at contribution margin. Sometimes if you look at the overall business profitability, you can also try to explain, hey, these initiatives are driving bottom line numbers. And I think CFOs would, would appreciate seeing things from a financial perspective as well, too. Yeah, and just to piggyback on that, because a lot of the work that I do is focused on translating softer metrics in so that we can attribute to them. So just bringing it down to brass tacks for a minute, I think creating proxy metrics is a good way to value those top of funnel or softer um, conversions like a video view or a store visit. So for instance, store visit, how do you assign value to that? Well, you can make some assumptions based on conversion rate and AOV and in-store metrics that you have from other data sources. And that will at least allows you to count it in the mix. Um, YouTube video views, another really great example. What impact does that have on the effectiveness of your Google search budget? It's the same network. It's the same account manager. Work with them to understand what is the impact of those upper funnel metrics on your lower funnel conversion metrics. And that gives you a number to work with. Um, you can use that in placing your spend. And then again, test it, turn it off, see what happens. Um, if you turn off your YouTube spend for a month, that might be scary, say two weeks, um, does your, your search performance down, down the road ha see a drop off? Um, so I think bringing it down to brass tacks, it's all about just putting putting a stake in the ground and saying i'm going to count this as x and then i'm going to validate that and and test into it that's awesome it, while we're on top of funnel any other thoughts on that because i thought that was some pretty interesting stuff that you guys are coming up with, especially you know kelly i thought that was really nice any other thoughts on top of funnel marketing before we turn over to the some of the audience questions because i'll tell you what this is honestly one of the best webinars I've seen for audience questions. The questions are awesome. <laughs> They're just good. So I, I want to kind of get off my script and start getting their questions answered. But before that, top of funnel, any other thoughts on that before we move on? Yeah, there, was, there was a couple of questions regarding uh, impression level data and sort of not having access to that uh, with cookies and privacy and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, one way of testing that I think would be uh, the holdout groups or just turning it off. Uh, you, you can turn it off if it's, uh, and there's one interesting example I wanted to share. So before this webinar, I shopped around for stories, uh, like cool stories about attribution inside our company. And one, this one I came across and I wanted to mention that because this was, uh, this was a company that was sending out a lot of emails and, uh, what they noticed, I don't know whether it was by mistake or uh, like they just did not send emails someday or to some group of people. But what they realized was that just sending emails, even without those emails being opened, that was driving revenue because the mm -hmm. customers, when they looked inside their email, they saw the brand as the sender. And that's something to me, like that's a super specific uh, touch point. Most people wouldn't even consider like tracking or measuring or thinking about. But if you just turn off those emails, uh, you would see a drop in revenue. And the interesting sort of uh, thing that could lead to is then maybe you're now uh, sort of pushing email campaigns with deals and discounts. 
So maybe you don't have to do that. Like maybe you don't need to include the discount in the email and cut into your profit margin if all of the lift is coming from the fact that the person sees your brand in their inbox. So that's something I, that's maybe interesting to test. I just wanted to add, I 100% agree with Martin. I, I call it the halo effect, right? Every time you drop an email, there are going to be impacts to other metrics. And I think that's the same point about upper funnel, you know, television advertising or other forms of upper funnel marketing is you're running that, but then maybe you'll see a better improvement on your bottom of the funnel conversion metrics and being able to measure that is definitely the art and the science. So absolutely agree on those points. Yeah. And I think two, two things I'll add. The first is that to do what Martin's talking about, you have to have a pretty strong uh, first party data strategy and a really solid contact history in your first party data structure. So making sure every time somebody's included in your SMS file or your email file, that touch point is recorded, even if it's not an open, but then you record the open and the click, et cetera. And then the second thing I would say is that you can bring the science to the upper funnel as well. In a, with a former client, one of the things that we did is we actually correlated Google branded Google search and organic social conversations to the ad spots that they aired over the course of a promo period for a film. And so just thinking outside of the box of, okay, so I can't see sales, obviously, based on this television placement, but as a consumer, what would I do in their shoes if I saw a brand or a company? And then how do I try to measure those things? Because people leave digital footprints all over the place. And again, if you can get creative about how to measure those, I think you can find directional results that are very helpful. Yeah. And I would just add to, to Kelly's point is a few ways to do that is have a baseline on your direct to site uh, traffic you know, your navigational terms, people searching for your brand, whether it's paid search or organic. Um, so when you do run those upper funnel campaigns, it is gonna turn into a navigational search, absolutely. So having a baseline and then measuring those, that's really what it comes down to is having multiple inputs in terms of what's driving, uh, you, know, the, those, um, you know, those branded searches. And then also post-purchase surveys are great too. Ask your customers, where did you hear about us? If you're running an upper funnel campaign, make sure those upper funnel channels are listed in your post-purchase surveys. You know, how did you hear about us? I mean, that's going way back, right? That's been around for ages. So there's even some basic things that you could do, and it'll just really help have a more holistic view of what's really driving performance. Yeah, the old everything old is new again, right? You have to go back and hit those fundamentals constantly. So, uh, Martin, you alluded to a question from our audience, from Ryan McClurk, and I just want to make sure everyone had a quick chance to talk on this. Uh, Ryan asked, uh, how do you recommend we handle advertisers refraining from sharing impressions and attribution data feeds due to uh, CCPA and GDPR concerns? Uh, first party strategy is only part of the solution because you lose the view through data. I just want to make sure that question had a, a yeah. full chance so, to so get thought about thank it. Thank you. Thank you for circling back to that. I did, I did want to underline that. Like, I think this was the answer to that question. So mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to, like, you don't need to track the impression to be able to measure the effect of the impression. And I yep. think that's what we were talking about. Like, uh, yeah, that, I just want to make sure that, that was, that yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's good. Answered. It's good. It's good to circle back to the question and uh, maybe uh, Craig or Ryan have a follow up. So let's make sure we answer those questions. Going once, going twice. No, we're good. All right, moving right along. <laughs> hey, we, we got things to do here. Yeah, All sure. right, from Scott Silverman whom uh, one of our very own. Uh, any thoughts on attribution based on the same creative or offer used in different channels? Uh, can you learn about creative that works in one channel better than another? Jeff, any thinking on that one? Yeah, so I've, I've worked with some attribution solutions that, you know, that say they can provide granular level detail at every combination of, you know, campaign, ad group, keyword, that's a search example, but, but down to the very, um, you know, the, the creative variant. And I think it's great to strive for that, but I also don't think that uh, perfect should get in the way of good. And so it might be that there's a ton of value, even with making allocations between marketing channels. And, and so that might be more of a, like a media mix model type approach. And so don't, don't wait to have visibility to every creative to start making decisions with one or two degrees uh, of less granularity, because that I, I think that will get you to a better place sooner. 
And one of the things that we that hasn't come up yet is machine learning. And I just love the options that Google provides here in terms of stuffing the ad group with different creatives and just letting the machine serve based on what works. It doesn't only apply to Google. There are other technologies for other channels that do something similar, test multiple, and then just run with what works. And I think what it does is it takes some of the pressure off of having the perfect creative just to get started. And then you can get data back and start making decisions based on the data. And you're already farther along than you would have been if you just sat there and waited and tested two different creatives with a, a panel or something um, for two months before you actually hit the ground. All right. Yeah. So, uh, and go, go for it. Maybe just to add to that, like, uh, more is always better. Like if you launch more creative, uh, the machine learning algorithms, even if you aren't able, like if you have four ads running in an ad group in whatever advertising channel you're using, there will be machine learning and the ads will get optimized for that particular channel. So it's just worth like uh, investing in more creative. All right. Got a couple of random questions here. I'm going to make certain we get to them. Chris Smith uh, asked earlier, uh, interest, he's interested in comments on attribution in a post iOS 14 world and journey attribution as opposed to last click attribution. Anyone want to hammer on that one? Silence from the audience. That's OK. This is live. This is OK. Not, <laughs> not every question is going to get answered. Chris, we tried, oh, I'll man. Take that one. I'll take that one. Um, I mean, it's hard. So I'll just start there, normalizing that we're all struggling with it. Um, and then I'll say that, you know, you've got to work with your partners. We have partnerships with some of the major players and we're holding hands as we step into this. Um, I think, you know, as much as we say, have a healthy skepticism for what your third party vendors report back, I would say also like they're here to help you succeed. And they have a lot more data scientists than you do. Like they're really good at engineering. So take the best of what they're doing. I know that both Google and Facebook have come up with solutions that they're working toward. And so you can go as high level as a blog post or as, as deep as the white paper to see how effective that is. I think they're reporting, last I saw was 95% accuracy with some of the tools that they're building out. So, you know, it's it doesn't need to be an adversarial relationship especially in the face of technological changes that they're at the forefront of. And I would just add to um, Kelly's comments as well as the last question on um, in terms of cookies going away. Um, and this was key part of Martin's presentation. I was actually in the background getting ready to play the piano actually is the first party data strategy was touched on super critical, right? When these shifts into more consumer privacy are going to be taking place making sure you're collecting as much information where you do have consent from your audience, making sure that you provide that value exchange, right? Whether it's a loyalty program, what are the features and benefits of you creating an account? Um, I think today we have, you know, teams that are dedicated to various channels within an organization I've been around. I think there needs to be teams dedicated to your first party data strategy and really to prepare for those privacy changes coming that are going to be coming. And then machine learning is a third point there, you know, more of that predictive um, intelligence. It's like you're going to have you're, you have to get as many people logged in as you can. And then there's going to be a lot of machine learning models that are coming that are going to predict future behavior or other audiences where you can't track them today. With cookies, you can track almost 100 percent of your audience. Well, that's going to be changing. So you have to really drive getting users logged in. And then there's going to be more modeling that's going to be coming out in the future that's going to help you predict what people that aren't logged in are more likely to do. And that you're still going to be able to drive customer acquisition and things like that in the future. So I don't think it's a doom and gloom scenario. You just like need to prepare for the change. If you prepare, then you'll have a strategy and you'll be in the best position to, to succeed and flourish. If you're going to wait until 2022, then I think you're going to probably run into some issues. Yeah. And just to Alan's point of what's old is always new again like we've been dealing with this on the brand side we've been dealing with this on the offline side i mean we have more than 250 physical stores this has always been a challenge it's just all about applying some of the best practices that we've we've learned on those sides of the business to a digital business as well and making sure that we're we're not forgetting how much we've already learned all right next question from abby whitmer can you take us through a turning off 
scenario with KPIs to look at across channels to decipher incrementality. For example, you turn off Facebook paid advertising for two weeks. What specific KPIs on what channels should we look at in terms of drop off and what time frame? Is it only during the time frame? Is it for a full month after? What are your thoughts on that? Do you want to reread that or were you guys ready to rip into that? That's a yeah. lot. Yeah, that there's a lot there. <laughs> Kelly, <laughs> I'll yeah. let you start. Well, I think um, starting with your existing customer journey work to understand what are the touch points that you typically see follow or could see following a Facebook engagement or along before or after a Facebook engagement, you want to make sure that they're all included. Um, and like I said, you want to follow those digital footprints. So traffic engagement, um, not only of your site traffic and add to cart rate, but also of those on other channels. So if somebody, if you're seeing an increase in your click-through rate on Google search for uh, the, the period during that time, or I would say like, I would measure at least 90 days after the fact and do a, a trending analysis based on that. And I, I think that the, the key point I would emphasize, because I'm not going to try to solve it all on this call on the, on the fly based on memory, is that you have to have a really robust plan in place before you do this type of work. So not going in blind, um, understanding what your gaps are going to be, because you're going to have gaps in your measurement, and also how to address the gaps to the best of your ability, and working with a team of analysts that can check you, you know, who ask the right questions and say, what about this? And how are you, how are you thinking about this? And being prepared to bring your vendors along is, is an important piece as well. But sit down and strategically think about it. You don't just turn it off. You, you plan for it, you plan into it, and then you don't do it just with one channel. You do it, the, you repeat the test on multiple channels over time. Um, and if you're doing a matched market testing, be sure you have experts in the room because you can't just pick two markets that seem the same and go with it. Um, that's when I rely heavily on external partners to help, again, gut check what we're doing. Alan, if we have time, I can jump in on that one as well, too. Jump away, my friend, jump um, away. So I'll share a personal, personal example, and this is one that I shared on the last panel. It was our affiliate channel. This was our example of actually being willing to turn something off to see what the impact is going to be. So we had an affiliate program for many years, and being a retailer, a large majority of our affiliate program were coupon affiliates, right? Um, and as many of you know, you, you go, you're shopping online, you get to that coupon box, and what's your first thing? I'm gonna go search Google for this particular coupon affiliate. And it's another perfect example of attribution gone wrong as well too. You look at your analytics reporting, you look at your last click reporting, and it's saying, hey, this affiliate channel is super profitable. It's driving a ton of revenue. But what we found is it's just a channel that's inserting itself into the path of conversion. And that's what you really want to avoid. So I think it was our willingness to say, hey, you know what? We have a, a hypothesis here. Well, to test it out, we really have to be willing to turn it off. And we did. And what we found is that revenue now just showed up in other channels. Some of it went to direct, some of it went to organic, some of it went to paid search. So it's a perfect example of attribution and really understanding what's really happening. Um, and we didn't see an impact to revenue and we saved you know, probably half a million a year in savings that got reinvested into other forms of marketing that actually drove bottom line results. So that's a perfect example. But to, to Kelly's point is, have a baseline, know what you're measuring. So when you go into it, you know, hey, did this work? Did it not? Do I need to roll it back? And sometimes be willing to kind of say, hey, am I going to run this test for two weeks? Is it a month? Because if you have that willingness, then you'll, you'll be able to see it through. Sometimes people are more reactionary and they may not give it the amount of time that's necessary to really get some good results. And this is why I'm a huge fan of match market testing, because you talk to any retailer about running a two week study and it's never comparable. Your two weeks are never the same because you have a promo here, you have a holiday there. Like you're looking at the calendar for all of these things. So I, I recommend going with a matched market test if you have a big enough scale or if you're digital first, even, even better um, it, when you're thinking about this because the calendar matters so much. Yeah, and yeah. maybe maybe just one uh, five second uh, ad here. Uh, there's a fantastic article about uh, the advertising effect versus the selection effect. So if anyone uh, would like to understand more of what uh, Human was talking about, like the 
example they use there is a guy who stands in front of a pizza place and hands out coupons. Seems like a marketing genius to the owner of the pizza place who's seeing everybody come in with the coupon from this guy. So uh, that's a great read. And it's I, I think, Jeff, you also made this point in the beginning. Like, it's really important to understand which uh, of like what uh, which channels actually impact the customer behavior in terms of influencing them and which channels are just there because that's what people do. So we're, we're starting to run out of time, but I, I'm, I'm going to get these questions in uh, if it kills you. So uh, Jeff, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to, I'm going to put this one on you. You made a comment earlier and I absolutely want to get back to it about incrementality versus attribution. I'm just tossing that to you run with it as you see fit. Well, I think the, the pizza parlor example was a really, really good illustration of that. And, uh, there, so there is a difference between being able to measure every touch point before a conversion and understanding which of those touch points actually made a difference. And so I'd argue that a, a mature attribution program has an element of incrementality embedded in it as well. Perfect. Martin, I think we're going we're gonna to put the last question to you. And it's the one um, when you brought it up on our prep call. Uh, I really just kind of thought you were trying to commit, you know, professional suicide because I think your comment was something to the effect that attribution may not be as useful as everyone thinks. And so I'd like to know why you're trying to put yourself out of a job. It's on to you. Yeah. So, so thankfully, thankfully, our business is not doing attribution modeling. So, like, we, uh, so okay. so I'm not putting myself out of business. Uh, the comment and where I alluded to, and I think we've touched on like a lot of these topics here today. Uh, Attribution, if you look only at attribution as your silver bullet to sort of so solve all your marketing problems, it's never going to work because uh, you're, you're going to lose sight of the customer inevitably. Like if you just look at the data, you will never be able to fully understand the customer. And I think Kelly made this point and it was an excellent point in our prep call on Monday. Attribution will never help you identify new opportunities because it's just measuring of what was it's not going to point you in the direction of growth in terms of trying new stuff, whether that's creative, whether that's new channels uh, or any innovation you are trying in your marketing efforts. Yeah, that, we did have a nice conversation about that. I'll, I'll open it up to our retailers. Any, any last thoughts on that or anything else we covered today? Going once. And just, yes, <laughs> so, so, sorry, Kelly, just to, just to sort of, uh, put it like uh, where, where it should be. I'm not saying attribution is like worthless or people shouldn't do it. It's absolutely super important to look at data. It's just that you need to recognize how important it actually is and not make it like not, not look at it too much, but also not too little. Yeah. And because Martin hat tipped me, I'll hat tip him right back and go back <laughs> to the, the five stages of maturity. Um, and just like normalize that everybody starts somewhere and that something is always better than nothing. And just because you may be in one or two doesn't mean that that's bad. It's certainly better than not being on the starting line at all. So don't be afraid to try the next thing that you feel like you're ready for and incorporate the next step, but always build out that roadmap of where do I want to be in six, nine, 12 months with this? Because I think it's, it's never going to stop. It's going to continually change and we just have to keep evolving. All right. Any final thoughts from the panel? Anything that you can think that needed to be said or anything that marketers could do right now to make their attribution efforts more profitable? Last words of wisdom. Human, anything from you, sir? I mean, not, not to be a personal plug, but to add to Kelly's point about trying new things. I mean, we recently partnered with the Professional Fighters League, Mixed Martial Arts. And typically brands, right? You think mixed martial arts, who would do a sponsorship, but it was really about trying new things, understanding our audience. You know, our, our customers are DIY. They're working on vehicles. They're more likely to also be into sports and, and these, these types of things. So understanding your customer at the end of the day trumps everything. And for us, that's really what it came down to. It wasn't having hesitation. It was like professional fighters league MMA. Yeah, let's give it a shot. Let's see what it does. And, uh, and super excited to, to, to try new things in that fashion. Jeff, what are your thoughts? Anything? So I, uh, I echo the understanding your customers. And I also want to caution everyone that just because you know that the most common conversion path is from TV to search to affiliates to purchase, 
it doesn't tell you necessarily why it happens. And so don't forget the need to understand the why along the way uh, versus just using the data and say, well, oh, we should spend more on TV, you know, because it puts everyone on this magical path. And then just to overcomplicate that one more step, segmentation, segmentation, segmentation. If you think all your customers are the same, you've got another thing coming. Um, so invest in that. Use tools where you can, because now data is at the scale where we can't just create four personas and have that capture everyone. Um, we are going to the place where you will need software to support you. Um, and that is not a plug for any software platform that may or may not be on the call. It's just saying humans are only so powerful. That's right. Yeah, and, and since since you've all uh, been very nice and set this up uh, greatly, just like we practiced, uh, <laughs> uh, if if you are now thinking about your first party data strategy, Exponia.com is definitely a website you should visit. Like your first party data <laughs> you, strategy. You were getting that in, weren't you? you were <laughs> yeah, get I, mean, that in. I mean, everybody set it up so nicely. Like, I, I couldn't agree more. The yeah. first party data is super important. So uh, <laughs> if you're just now figuring that out, uh, be sure to visit our website and will help you. Uh, well, thank you so much, everyone. I really do appreciate uh, all of you uh, coming out today. So I just want to thank our speakers, uh, Kelly Sternhagen, Jeff Sanders, Human Akvan, and Martin Simo. Thank you so much. Appreciate you guys being here today. And now we will wrap up here. Next week, we have advanced content marketing strategies from publishers to influencers. That's Wednesday, March 17th. That's with Natalie Brown from Sir Latab, Alexis Caldwell from Reward Style, Emily Chan from Our Place. Looks like it's going to be Battle of the Pans. And Ellen Killen from Partner Eyes. Love to have everyone join us for that. You can also see Commerce Next on YouTube. Love to have everyone go out there, check out our video, subscribe. We put up a new video uh, every week. And finally, thank you. We really appreciate everyone coming out and joining us today. We appreciate that you take the time uh, to be with us, and we'll see you next week. Thanks so much.